Um, so we are going to move on now, and um, our last speaker, but certainly not least, is uh, Dr. Pryskovsky, uh, one of our medical oncologists from Dana-Farber who has a particular interest in uh, risk and genetic risk and non-genetic risk, and she is going to uh, talk with us this morning about risk-reducing medications. So uh, welcome, Brittany. Thank you for the introduction. So um, I just want to first say I'm excited to be here today. And the medications that I will discuss are known as chemo prevention, but from a pharmacologic standpoint, they are not chemotherapy. Let's see how I, there, figured out how to advance the slides. So our options for risk-reducing therapies depend on a woman's menopausal status. Premenopausal women are eligible for tamoxifen dosed at 20 milligrams or 5 milligrams, and postmenopausal women are eligible to take tamoxifen, raloxifene, anastrozole, and extamestane. The last two medications, anastrozole and extamestanes, are aromatase inhibitors. In contrast, tamoxifen and raloxifene are in a class of medications known as SERMs. Tamoxifen was FDA approved for breast cancer prevention in 1999, and this was based on three important clinical studies. And the most important study that I'll touch base about a little bit later is called the NSABP P1 study, and this was performed in the United States. So all of these medications have side effects. The one that stands out for most women is the fact that they cause hot flashes and menopausal symptoms. So as a provider though, the most concerning side effects are with tamoxifen and raloxifene where we see blood clots. Um, it's a very mild risk, but there is an increased risk of both deep vein thromboses and pulmonary embolisms. So tamoxifen also has a small increased risk of uterine cancer. So I'm gonna first talk about the NSABP P1 trial. This was the first breast cancer prevention trial. It was a randomized trial that enrolled close to 16,000 women and they were selected to take tamoxifen or placebo for five years. The study period was from 1992 and 1996. So these options have been around for a while. Women were eligible for the, the study if they were age greater than 60 or if they were between the ages of 35 and 59 with a five-year predicted risk of breast cancer greater than 1.6% or if they had a diagnosis of a high-risk lesion like LCIS. Women needed to be healthy to be included in the study without evidence of breast cancer and not pregnant, and they could not be on hormonal um, therapy or hormonal replacement therapy. So in the P1 trial, after more than five years of follow-up, tamoxifen was shown to reduce the risk of invasive and non-invasive breast cancer by 50%, and this was statistically significant. There was a second tamoxifen versus placebo study that was called IBIS-1, and this confirmed the result that we saw in P1, and this showed a breast cancer reduction while patients were on therapy, and then also when therapy had stopped. And so this, in this study, patients were on tamoxifen for five years and the efficacy and the risk reduction occurred while patients were on therapy for that five year period of time, but also 15 years after therapy had stopped. So there's this long lasting benefit to taking chemo prevention. And then in this study, Basically, the preventative effects of these agents is to reduce the risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So after this, tamoxifen was also compared to raloxifene in the STAR trial, and raloxifene was showed to have um, efficacy, but in addition, tamoxifen had efficacy. And then there were two trials looking at aromatase inhibitors for breast cancer prevention in postmenopausal women. And all of these agents are efficacious in this context. So when I talk to patients in clinic about these options, the biggest barrier in, is the worry about the hot flashes. So we all have negative images of hot flashes and hot flashes can be daily and they can be debilitating. However, most patients do 
just fine with these medications. In regards to these serious side effects, the blood clot risk with tamoxifen is 0.5% and the endometrial cancer risk is 0.4%. And the endometrial cancer risk does not extend after therapy has stopped. So in contrast to tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors do not have the blood clot or the endometrial cancer risk, but they do cause bone loss and they cause more joint aches and pains. And I sometimes find that aromatase inhibitors are not as tolerable as tamoxifen and raloxifene. So in all of these trials, there was some concern about the association with coronary heart disease risk and the risk of stroke. There was a slight trend towards more coronary artery disease and stroke in the P1 study, but this was not significant statistically compared to placebo. There was a slight increased risk of cataracts with tamoxifen, but this is very rare and it's intervenable with surgery. So in the context, um, this led us to investigate um, low-dose tamoxifen in Italy. So this was a study that looked at 5 milligrams of tamoxifen compared to 20 milligrams, which was the standard. The idea was that 5 milligrams would be more tolerable, and they looked at a shorter duration of therapy of three years. The study showed that low-dose tamoxifen for three years reduced the incidence of breast cancer. This was a big result, and it was practice changing for us here at Brigham and Women's and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And compared with tamoxifen in the study, there was more frequent hot flashes, okay? So between tamoxifen five milligrams and placebo, there was not a significant difference in the hot flash intensity, vaginal dryness, or musculoskeletal pain. However, for both vaginal dryness and musculoskeletal pain, they, they, these side effects increased with time over the three years of the study. And I think this really just reflects that um, patients on this study are aging. And so they do develop um, more dryness and maybe get more achy with age. And so I tell patients that we feel very comfortable if they do have vaginal dryness while on chemo prevention of using um, estradiol creams. So that is something that we frequently prescribe if patients do experience that symptom. So there is also data that low-dose tamoxifen at a dose of 2.5 milligrams can decrease breast density. So this is an advantage, too, since lowering breast density allows for early detection. So in B-PREP, since we started um, this B-PREP clinic, around 23% of patients with high-risk lesions, including atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and LCAS. These patients will start chemo prevention, and we found that up to a third of women will start greater than six months after their first visit. This is work that we've published. I've published this with Dr. King and Dr. Laws, and this basically means that sometimes patients need to ponder this decision before starting chemo prevention, and that's completely fine. Since we started offering do low dose tamoxifen, it has become one of our most popular options in the clinic. And for most women, I recommend starting at five milligrams. And if they're premenopausal, I'll try to encourage them to go up to the 20 milligram dose if they're able to tolerate the therapy. In postmenopausal women, women, we feel very comfortable with the five milligram dose. So, in conclusion, medications can prevent breast cancer in both pre- and postmenopausal women who are high risk. There's a lower chance of serious side effects if women try these therapies at a younger age. So we definitely target our younger women who are higher risk in their 40s and 50s to consider chemo prevention. Tamoxifen also lowers the risk of breast cancer while women are on therapy, but also when therapy has stopped. Low-dose tamoxifen may be more tolerable than the 20 milligram dose. Low-dose can also decrease breast density on mammogram and is likely best for women who are postmenopausal. But for women who are premenopausal, we'll often start, start at the five milligrams and discuss increasing to a higher dose. And I think that's kind of 
the, the summary of chemo prevention in this context. Great. Happy to mm -hmm. answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Biskovsky. Maybe you can just keep that slide there for a moment while we while we look at some questions. Um, so one question that just came in was, do you have a smaller chance of developing a blood clot with the lower dose of tamoxifen? So I would say we don't have great data to look at that endpoint because the trial for low dose tamoxifen in Italy was a smaller study. So in contrast to the NSABP1 study that included 16,000 women, the study in Italy with low dose tamoxifen only included 500 women. Would you agree, Dr. King? Well, it was a smaller number of women, but they did look at those serious adverse events like thrombosis and uterine cancer, and, the, and there was no statistically significant increased risk compared to placebo. So yeah. we all walk around with a certain low level of risk of developing a blood clot. If we do things like smoke cigarettes or take hormone replacement therapy or even birth control pills, all of those things slightly elevate our risk of developing a blood clot. Um, but as Dr. Biskovsky noted, the risk after being on five years of tamoxifen is still only about a half percent. So it really is small, but it's something that women need to be aware of so that if they were to develop some unusual leg pain or some unusual leg swelling, that they would know to call their physicians, have it evaluated, potentially stop the, the medication uh, until they were sure that they didn't have um, a blood clot. But yeah. again, as we've said throughout this forum, you know, all of all of these um, all of the information for women at elevated risk of breast cancer really needs to be personalized. You know, whether it's increased, whether it's using MRI, whether it's using medication, it really is a discussion about the risks and benefits um, for each individual, and understanding that these medicines are are one of the options um, that we have. And and importantly, as as was mentioned. It, these medications prevent or reduce the risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. We still need a lot of work to identify um, ways to reduce the risk of estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. And Dr. Eliason's uh, research on diet is you know, really important in that arena. Um, and just again, a plug for the women with the high risk lesions, uh, Dr. Biskovsky showed you uh, that in our our program, about a quarter of our women with high-risk lesions uh, will choose to try these medications. These medications are particularly effective in women with high-risk lesions because women with high-risk lesions overwhelmingly get hormone receptor positive breast cancer, ER positive breast cancer. So when we know what type of breast cancer a woman is most likely to develop, then these, um, these strategies become increasingly important and effective in, in that group. Um, so we have a question about the TAM gel study. So Dr. Biskovsky uh, and, and the rest of us, we, we participated in that study. We put patients on the trial. Um, do you want to give us a, an update, um, Brittany, any news out yet? I, I don't think the final results have been published. Yes, definitely. Hopefully think... soon. Yes, we're all very eager to um, see the results of the TAM gel study. For those of you um, who aren't familiar with it. it uh, as, as we've said, the side effects of these medicines are, are the biggest barrier often to um, getting patients to, to try them and take them. And so there have been, there's a lot of research in looking at, again, alternate ways to deliver the active ingredients of tamoxifen. And so one of the one of the ways that was being studied was putting the, the medicine in a gel and then asking women to rub the gel on their breast uh, once a day for a year. And the investigators were looking to see if using that gel resulted in a change in breast density, which as Dr. Pitskovsky said, showing that we've reduced breast density is a good sign that we're reducing breast cancer risk. And so we eagerly await the results of that study. And, and if in fact, that study does show that um, putting the gel with tamoxifen on the breast, if that reduces breast density, then that will be a really, um, big signal and a, and a good opportunity for that gel to go into even a larger trial where we would um, really be looking to see if it can uh, prevent breast cancer. Um, so here we have another um, question 
Um, should, a, should a patient take another round of tamoxifen if she took it and it's been a long time? So 15 years, she, she took five years of tamoxifen, 15 years later, should she take another round? I, I would say probably not. The only situation where I think it could be discussed and it could be a personalized discussion would be if, for example, something was found on a biopsy, like a high-risk lesion, including ADH, ALH, LCIS, then I think there could be a, a nuanced discussion about um, you know, considering another medication for prevention, whether that's an aromatase inhibitor or tamoxifen for a short, short period of time. But typically, if patients have taken 20 milligrams of tamoxifen for five years, we would not recommend um, additional therapy. Yes. Um, okay. And how about one more? Does taking UVFM more than three times a week increase your risk of breast cancer? N I would say, no, it does not increase your risk of breast cancer. So this is a, a medication that's used typically for vaginal dryness. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, I think, discussions about systemic absorption of medications. And the really the studies show that these medications do not increase breast cancer risk significantly. Yes, and uh, very important even in our breast cancer survivors, if they're having significant challenges with vaginal dryness, we are very comfortable with them using these um, topical agents. Um, so wonderful.